Adults in Only Mode. Hello everyone, this is Michael Bean from Forio Business Simulations and we're going to get started on our first of six workshops or webinars regarding uh, building simulations and the web simulation development fundamentals using Forio Simulate. I'm going to go ahead and start now. There's still some people joining us I can see from the um, GoToMeeting dashboard, but I want to keep it to an hour and we're going to try to do that for each of the six webinars that we'll be hosting over the next six weeks. And um, what we're going to do today is just drop and do a little bit of introduction around what uh, material we have um, and then jump into our first steps. So over the next six weeks, um, in a total of six hours, we're going to be covering the fundamentals of building a web simulation. And the first two weeks, what we're going to do is start with model building, because that's really the, the first step in, in, in creating a web-based simulation. You know, typically when we're building projects, we'll start with building a model, do that for two or three weeks, something like that, and then start on the interface design and then kind of iterate those things together as we progress. So um, we'll kind of follow that same format during this workshop, during the six-week workshop. The next two weeks, weeks three and four, we'll get into interface design. Um, we'll start off the basic user interface design and then get some um, slightly more advanced features, not the most advanced features that are available, but some some more advanced things that are available. And then lastly, We'll be covering some advanced concepts. We'll explain how multiplayer games work, and we'll also discuss game design and project management as kind of a, a summation of everything that we've covered over the previous five weeks. For today, what I thought we could do is just start off by showing kind of end results first. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at what a final simulation looks like. Um, these aren't sims that we're going to be building during the workshop today. We're going to start with something new, um, but I thought it would be useful just to kind of see what we're heading to, what kinds of things you could kind of expect to be able to um, put together at the end of six weeks, and beyond that even, what are some things that you might be able to put together in, say, six months after working with this system for a while. So I thought I'd show a couple of examples of that. And what I'm going to do is start off by showing you an example of um, a fairly simple simulation that was built around mobile phones. It's around uh, three different types of mobile phones that are for sale. These could be, you know, oriented around things like Android versus Apple uh, iPhone or something like that. And this is available, as an, and it happens to be in this case in my account on Forio Simulate. Um, this is copyable, by the way, if you're interested in later on. And I'm going to start off here just by showing you the model. It's a, this model is fairly simple. It's, I think, about 40 equations or so. So here you can see some of the equations for the model. And you know, the purpose of today and, and next week, actually, is to get into more details explaining how all of these work, but just take a look at that for a second here. We can also view the model and actually run the model from um, the Explore model option here for um, Model Explorer, and so here we can see some of the interconnections among the model uh, variables. And then next, what we could do is build a user interface, so this is the steps that we'll be going to in weeks three and four. Uh, in terms of building a user interface, we're going to be using the uh, UI designer that's built into Forio Simulate to do that for those two weeks. And here we're just loading that up, and you can see in here, just a second, <laughs> a number of pages. Uh, it's kind of a PowerPoint-like structure where you can see here's uh, the intro page, and then you know down here, for example, there's the uh, page that has pricing on it. You can see there's little objects down here that we can click on and decision variables and things like that. And then, of course, what we're all aiming for ultimately by doing this is to create a finished web simulation. So here's an example of that simulation after it's been compiled. The model's been built, the user interface has been built, and, um, and uh, here it's running. And I can go in and make decisions around allocating my R&D among these, um, these different cell phone products, for example and submit decisions, and it advances. There's a consultant here that kind of gives me some advice about how to proceed, and I can start to see some results in terms of my sales increasing or decreasing over time. There's also available financial information. For example, I can see you know, what my income is for these products and graphs of profit and, and so on. So I think that a reasonable goal for the, these six weeks is to build a simulation of roughly this quality. This is the kind of thing that you'll be able to, to put together fairly quickly after completing this. But there's, there's more options to this. There's much more sophisticated simulations that you can build using this tool directly, the, the, um, the, U, the interface designer that I'm showing you here. And you can also use uh, a RESTful API, an interface, to connect in and develop simulations that are purely web-based. 
uh, that are done, say, with HTML and JavaScript, for example, and sort of AJAX-style simulations, as well as doing simulations on other tools like, say, the iPhone or iPad or Android and things like that. So just to give you an example of, of, a, of a more elaborate simulation, here's one that we're currently developing for MIT. It's called Fishbanks. It's a multiplayer game. You see a nice login here. I just found out actually recently this is not a fishing boat. This is a tugboat. So it turns out we're going to have to replace that. But uh, it's the start of the simulation. And here you can see a harbor. And there's a chat availability here. And we can get into you know, choosing to sell some boats. And I'll say I'm going to sell some boats at 100 hundred dollars here and then they're they're available for sale and um, there's some reports here uh, that are in here with charts and tables that are available as well and I'd say this is kind of a, a typical slightly more sophisticated interface and I just showed you with the PDA sim and I, th I think something like this typically is developed by a team and something that you can put together over a few months something like that but I wanted to give you a flavor for what we're trying to do what we're trying to accomplish throughout these six weeks you know, really starting with these fundamentals, starting with the, the, the model um, building piece of it, and then it, moving on to the UI designer piece, and then learning things about how to do a multiplayer game like this, and also some things about project management and UI design. So what are we going to be covering today? Well, um, what I wanted to do is talk about similarities and differences to spreadsheets. I find it really useful to think about models that are built in this language, in the Fourier Simulate language, which is derived from system dynamics, which I know some of you who are attending today know about. Um, but I, I find it useful to compare them to spreadsheets. I think it's a good way to kind of create a metaphor for what we're doing in, in the model. It's a familiar way to, to go about it. So we're going to cover a little bit about that at the beginning. I want to talk about the five different statement types that are used for creating models that will help you get started, and then show a sample of functions that are available in Fourier Simulate. Then I'm going to show you how we kind of do this iterative approach to building models where you use the model explorer to test your model and build out more equations and things like that. At uh, near the end of today, what we're going to cover are array range basics. And then finally, we're going to, I'm going to reveal what I believe is the biggest mistake that a new modeler can make. So we're going to talk about that as well. And throughout the workshop today, we're going to be using real examples. So like I said, uh, I think a a simulation, or the type of simulation that we're building here, uh, which is mostly a system dynamic style simulation, although I think it deviates a bit from pure system dynamics. Um, I can explain that later on if you're interested. But um, it's, it's very similar to a spreadsheet that's been optimized for solving problems that occur over time. So let's take a look at that type of spreadsheet. So here's a very simple spreadsheet model. And what you can see is I started off in 2010. Um, so we have a little bit of history here, I guess, at this point, since it's 2011 today. Um, and we're advancing over a few years. And we can see price that's entered here. It's just a number that's entered over time. We have sales. And what I've done is I've grown sales by referencing the previous year. So you can see here I'm going one column back, and I'm saying that the sales are growing by 5%. So it goes up to uh, 1050 here. And then I guess I made a mistake. <laughs> So it should go this way, I guess. Okay, so it goes 5%, then 5% of that, 5% of this number, etc. So that's kind of growing over time. And then uh, revenue is just price times sales. So this is just time. It doesn't mean anything. It's just an in, it's a marker of how we're progressing through the sim. Here's our price, which is just a constant. Our sales, which are growing by 5%. And our revenue, which is price times sales. So that's, that's how this, this very simple spreadsheet is built. And if we're doing that in, um, in the Forio simulate language, let me expand this a little bit to make it easier for everyone to see, it's very similar in, in that we, what we've done, though, is we've simplified it. So we don't have to fill in all these cells. We can just describe it at the beginning and then run it forward, and it'll, it'll just make it easier to, to handle it. So it, it, it does a better job of handling these kinds of problems that are run over time. And what you can see here is we have start time of 2010. We have end time of 2015. We set this price, and I've put this D as a decision here, so it's something that the user could change. That's what that's referring to, of 500. We can see that revenue is price times sales. And then sales, the trickiest equation here to some extent, is using this previous function. And previous function is like, if you, the way I think about it is like columns in a spreadsheet. So you're referring to the previous column. So here it's saying the previous column should be sales times 1.05, so it's growing by that amount. Um, but then there's a problem with that because you have to start somewhere, right? So in our spreadsheet, 
the first cell wasn't actually set up with that. It was just a thousand, right? And then it, after that, it advanced from year to year. So we do the same thing here. We say, what's the initial value of this thing? It's a thousand. And then thereafter, it's going to use sales times that. So you can see it's kind of self-referential here. It's sales equals the previous sales times 1.05, and at the very first value, it's a thousand. So that's a very simple example of how that gets built, and we can look at that in the model explorer and see what that looks like. If I go to revenue here, it'll give me some more details and seeing. I think I only have three equations here. It says sales times price equals revenue, and you can see revenue growing over time uh, based on that. So uh, that's the basic progression with that. And one of the things, when, when people see these equations sometimes for the first time, they think it's sort of like programming. It's like um, writing something in JavaScript or writing something in some other language like PHP or something like that. And it is sort of, I mean, there's some similarities, I guess, in that you're describing equations and things. But I think, really, it's more similar to an Excel spreadsheet. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, in Excel, you don't have to state how you're defining your variables. You don't state what order they're in. If I take this thing, price here, for example, and I choose to move it just arbitrarily anywhere in here, the thing still works, right? It doesn't matter that price now appears below sales or revenue, even though revenue refers to... Um, to price, right? Revenue is sales times price, right? So, so now it's just using this cell reference instead of, of this one. And likewise, in simulate, if I take sales here, or actually I took revenue before, so I'll just stay consistent, and I move that up to the top like that, or I, 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 um, and I can still use that, I can still save that, and it'll still work the same way. So one of the things that Simulate does that's similar to what Excel does is it looks at the equations and figures out what the order of execution is automatically and then assembles it that way. So, so again, that's why I think the metaphor of a spreadsheet works pretty well for this, and it's less like, say, programming or something like that. And we're going to use this kind of iterative approach throughout, throughout the day-to-day -day for, um, for this. We'll be able to kind of see these examples. Now, I don't want to make this too dry. Um, so uh, what I thought we could do for today is use an example from the real world. And I was reading a New Yorker from about three weeks ago or so or two weeks ago. It was talking about energy efficiency. And I thought it was a good one. And this topic has come up um, for me a few times over the last year or so. Uh, it's Javon's paradox. And Javon was this guy that I think he was um, prior to Adam Smith or around the time of Adam Smith, something like that, that argued that improvements in fuel efficiency tend to increase rather than decrease fuel use. So, you know, the idea is in general, right, you have a more fuel efficient something, a more fuel efficient jet or a more fuel efficient car or machine or something. And what you might maybe expect is that the uh, fuel use would decrease over time because it's more fuel. You use less fuel. But what uh, Javon argued was um, that it's a, here's a specific well-known quote, is that it's a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to diminished consumption. The very contrary is true, is the truth. So the, the basic idea from this is that uh, energy efficiency results in higher energy productivity. So you can think of energy as kind of a form of productivity, like productivity of a machine, right? And so higher energy productivity means that there's a lower implicit price to the use of the energy, right? And so that lower implicit price is like typical supply and demand. It's like econ, uh, micro econ 101. You know, lower price means that there's going to be higher demand. And so the implication of that is that uh, demand is going to in, is in going to increase, and then more energy is going to be used. And by the way, I'm not arguing that this is sort of a, a truth for everything. I'm, I'm interested in it from a modeling perspective, not interested in like the specifics of whether or not this this holds for all cases and things like that. But I thought it would be sort of an interesting example to talk about uh, talk about throughout our workshop for today. So we're going to try to build this out um, throughout the next uh, next 45 minutes or so. And an example of this I thought we could use is um, refrigerators. And I have a couple of pictures here of some refrigerators. Here's a picture of a refrigerator from the early 1950s. So just take a look at that. And I'm going to show you a picture of a modern refrigerator. Um, and I want you just to note, what is the difference between these two refrigerators? And I have a few people in the room with me. Do, uh, do you, any of you guys know what the, to see a difference between these things? Capacity, Capacity precisely. <laughs> That's the key. So here we have this tiny refrigerator that has some probably big compressor down here in the bottom and uh, a small amount of space. It has a tiny little freezer here in the top. And uh, a modern refrigerator has more. And in fact, 
refrigerators have increased in fuel efficient or in electricity usage dramatically even in the last 25 years. Like a, um, a refrigerator from 1975 used twice as much energy per year than a modern refrigerator does, right? So there's this, what's it called, the star rating or something like that? I think that's what it's called that is used for energy. But consequently, too, the refrigerators have gotten larger. So there's sort of this argument that the square footage of a refrigerator is increasing as its energy efficiency is, is going up. And so that we're going to try to build out that, that principle in this model today. And the way we're going to do that is by working in the Fourier language directly. Um, that's the language that I prefer personally, not surprisingly perhaps, uh, for building models. There's other tools that you can use. You can use Excel if you want to. You can use a number of desktop modeling packages. But for today, what we're going to do is really walk through it from the, the modeling language. And even if you use one of those other packages, it's really useful to know this stuff because there's a lot of things that you can do by combining the, this Fourier simulate language settings with your own language, uh, the, your own preferred desktop tool to create useful uh, web models. So there's a lot of things around how do I define things as decisions or how do I format a number or you know, all kinds of things actually that are going to be useful for that. So I think that will help you even if you're say planning on using iThink or, or some other tool. Uh, um, okay, so let's start through our list here. We have the first on our, uh, on our list of five is a variable. And a variable can be either a constant or an equation. So an example of that here is um, uh, initial size. We have initial size of a refrigerator. I'm starting it off at 17 cubic feet. So it's just at 17 initially here. We can also do things um, that are constants by referring to other variables, assuming that this variable is a constant, which we know it is from this, the previous one here. So we can see here that average size is equal to initial size. Um, so we're just setting that out as an identity, essentially. But we can also do more complicated things, like we can see yearly spending on electricity, which is the main thing that we're interested, or one of the main things we're interested in here is the price of a kilowatt hour of electricity, um, the average refrigerator size, um, or and the kilowatt hours of electricity consumed per cubic foot. So those are different numbers that we're going to be interested in here. Um, you don't have to just stick with the basics of multiplication, division, um, subtraction and addition, of course. You can use functions, and it's very similar, again, I think, to Excel in terms of the type of functions you have, although you have this sort of extension of functions that are specialized, again, for solving these kinds of problems that occur over time. So a number of the sort of basic functions here that we see are things like absolute value, different things around rounding, ceiling, floor, and round. You can get integers, which is useful. You can do frac, which is the opposite of an integer. So you have 1.2, an integer would return 1. Frac would return 0.2. Uh, you can get modulus out of it. Safe div 0 just returns a 0 if the divisor is 0, right? So if, yeah, as you, may, you probably know, right, like if you divide a number by 0, it will return a question mark typically in a, um, in a, in a, in a tool like uh, Excel or other things. But a lot of times in models, we don't want it to do that. To give you a, kind of a concrete example of that, we do a lot of business simulations, and a lot of times we're calculating market share. And uh, if you have a couple of competitors at the beginning of a market that hasn't launched yet, then they have zero sales. So the way you would calculate sales would typically be my sales divided by the total market sales. That would give you your unit market share. But if the total unit market sales were zero, then you're dividing by zero, and you'd get a question mark. But really what you're saying is, is that my market share is zero, or you, that's probably a better answer than some undefined number. So we use safe div zero to, to manage that. Um, there's also max and min, pretty straightforward. You can do conditionals, and conditionals are formed in the same way that conditionals are formed in Excel. There's some, again, some things that are specific to time-based models. Remember, for example, is, is one of those where it will say, over time, I'll remember the value of something when the condition is true. It actually pretty much functions the same as an if statement, but it just stores the state of that uh, value over time. Um, there's some other things that are kind of like that with high val and low val. So what, what I want to do is within a uh, variable, I want to be able to say what's the highest value that it achieved during the run of the simulation. And high val will re return that. And same with low val, return the lowest value. And previous, we already saw. Um, step is just the current step. Step and time are kind of analogous to each other. Step is always predefined for you, and it starts at zero and increments by one time unit every, every uh, delta time, um, whereas current time can be arbitrarily defined. It could be 
um, you know, months, days, years, anything. So like in the, in the example we are showing a moment ago, it was going from 2010 to 2015. Time would be 2010, 11, 12, et cetera, where a step would be zero, would it be equal to 2010, one would be equal to 2011, et cetera. And then there's a number of stochastic or random functions that you can use, and you can use these for Monte Carlo type things. Uh, um, other things of just seeding your model. So there's uniform random, which is really basic, the kind of, I'd say the most standard thing that people use. Ran between, it's a little bit more complicated, but still very simple. And then some, um, some statistical style random functions like normal, uh, exponential, log normal, and Poisson. So, and obviously this isn't a complete set. <laughs> this is just a small number of them, but I think these are the ones that I personally am using the most, so I thought I would just, uh, you know, show them to you from here right now. Okay, next up after variables is, are decisions. Um, and a decision is a number that the user can change, um, uh, can enter or change. So uh, an example of that would be, an easy one is the price of, of a kilowatt of electricity. So it turns out from a little bit of research that I did in advance of our workshop today that in California at least a, a kilowatt hour of electricity is about 11 cents um, per hour per kilowatt hour. So, uh, so I put that, that, that's a decision that you can have. But you might change that. Let's say you're not in California, you're in Illinois or something. Then you could change that value to reflect what the local price of electricity is. And also we have, um, we want to get into what's the, what's a uh, kilowatt of electricity consumed per cubic foot, right? Because what we're interested in is how efficient are these refrigerators getting over time? And what I did is I went to the, I think I'll go to the next slide, I went to the EIA the Energy Information Administration website and dug up some information about electricity consumption uh, by end use in U.S. households in 2001, so it's 10-year-old data, but it's good enough, I guess, for what we're doing here. Um, and so refrigerators are consuming about uh, 1,239 kilowatt hours per unit. Um, and, uh, and so what I did was take 1,239 divided by the initial refrigerator size to get um, the cost per cubic foot. So that's the sort of, that's the measure that we're going to use in this. Um, so decision and variables are kind of like each other. You can see that uh, variables always start with V, decisions always start with D. The differences are that decisions can be changed by user input. So those are the, you cannot allow users um, to change decisions, or to change variables directly. They have to be defined as decisions. And the other item with it that's kind of related to it is by default, decision values are only calculated at the beginning of the simulation. So, um, so what happens here is if refrigerator size changed here, it wouldn't change in, in the future, it wouldn't change this, uh, this value because this only gets defined in step zero. And thereafter, it's not recalculated. There is a way that you can force it to recalculate and make it more like a variable, but by default, that's not how it operates. So, um, so those are the two, and really those are the two fundamental pieces of, uh, of building a model. Um, and then uh, third on our list of the five are model-wide properties. So here what, what model-wide properties do is set the default properties for all variables and decisions in your model. And you can see here kind of what it's doing, right? So if we're going to start this, um, this model uh, with, um, uh, with 2000, at 2010 and the end time at 2020, uh, then you know, that's going to work just fine. And then initial steps just defines the number of steps that the model runs before the use, when the user first starts up. So we want to, sometimes we want to have some history available for users, and that's the way that we can get that information in. Um, execute de decision immediately equals true means that when we implement a decision that it will instantaneously change values in the model. And sometimes we want to do that and sometimes we don't. And so what we can do is define that for what we, we think most of the decisions in our model will be like for the default for everything and then for the specifics we have the ability to change it by, um, by variable uh, or excuse me, rather by decision if we want to. And I'll explain more of that in a little bit. And then lastly, we can do things like set the default number format for, for a model. So, um, Matt, I just saw that I got some kind of message about uh, audio quality issues or something. So I just want to check to make sure that, can people hear me okay? Um, can, can you, if you can, I think there's ability to raise your hand. Is that right or something? So people can hear me okay, Matt? Thanks a lot. I just want to make sure that's still working, right? All right. So let's, um, let's get started with this and stop kind of we'll go into actually uh, building something out here. And what I've done is um, 
create, oops, that's not where I wanted to go. Let's see here. Um, okay. What I've done is start, create a kind of starter model here. Right, so what I've done is I have the start time of 2010, end time of 2020, initial steps of two, execute decision immediately equal true, and the number format for all numbers in here is pound, 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 zero, which is kind of like what Excel does, right? So it's going to put uh, two decimals there. Um, we have this, our single decision. Uh, we have our, our price and uh, initial size of our refrigerators at 17 cubic feet, uh, average size equal initial size, and then yearly spending on electricity. So I built this. Very simple. And by the way, one thing here, you don't have to put everything on a single line, so I put this out on, on separate lines here because I think it's easier to see. And that can be really useful formatting for, for uh, when you're constructing you know, very complicated equations here. So I'm going to go ahead and save my model. And I can confirm that it's uh, working properly here. So you see the yearly spending on electricity is building out. And it's running flat um, So because I haven't made any changes on decisions here or anything. And I can start to use this actually, this format for exploring how the model works. So if I go to decision control up here, I can click on that and I can see now that the variable that I've marked as a decision is filled out for me. Notice now that it's, it's returning the, the, the value of that, of, which is, what was it, 1289 or something like that, divided by 17 is, turns out to be 72.88 for the kilowatt hours of electricity consumed per cubic foot. Um, and I can reset this, so I'm back at the beginning, and I can see now that it's actually um, running for uh, a couple of years here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and enter a number of, uh, of 50, and I'm going to step it to end. And uh, I can see that um, in some places here, uh, the uh, numbers have changed. The, the yearly spending has gone down, but the average size of my refrigerators, the variable I'm really interested in, has not changed over time. So actually, my yearly spending on electricity has gone down. So this does not, in fact, copy Javon's uh, paradox. It might be Jevon's paradox, actually. I'm not sure. <laughs> Check on that. <laughs> anyway, I just was it. But in, in any case, um, this is sort of the the sort of the more the, 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 the other case around this, right? So we're not actually doing, we want, so it turns out that average size doesn't work here. And uh, that's not unusual when building models. That's something that happens, happens a lot. So what we want to do now is modify our model and add some uh, more complex equations to solve that problem. So I'm going to go in here now and add in some, uh, a new variable. And I'm going to call this the uh, electricity efficiency ratio, and I'm going to make that equal to the initial value of the um, kilowatt hours of electricity consumed per cubic foot um, divided by, oh, and I have to put a close, close uh, paren here, divided by the um, kilowatt hours consumed per cubic foot. So what I have now is a ratio of electricity efficiency that it's kind of backwards to normal ratios in that it, um, it uh, as the efficiency goes up, this ratio, or efficiency improves, this ratio will go up. You might expect it to go the other way, but what happens is as efficiency goes up, the ratio goes up, right? So, and, and by the way, just to check um, for um, anyone, either um, who's connected online or who's in the room with me right now, what's the starting value of the electricity efficiency ratio? Can anyone tell me? It's not. Um, any other? Paul? It's one, exactly. And the reason for that is um, the, the, it's starting at the initial value divided by the current value. But initially, the current value and the initial value are identical. And so it's the initial value, which is kilowatt hours of electricity consumed per cubic foot, divided by kilowatt hours consumed per, by cubic foot is going to be equal, always equal to one. It's an identity. Um, but thereafter, it could change, right? So in future years, this will maintain whatever the first value was, but this value can float around, which means that if our electricity um, usage goes down, then we're dividing by a smaller number, which means the ratio is going to go up, right? So then, um, and this is why I set this up this way, then I can do the initial size here. I'm going to say the average size of my refrigerators then is going to increase by the electricity efficiency ratio. So that's my objective here. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And we've used that function initial, and that gets used a lot in models like this. And now we can see if we solved our problem here in terms of creating something that's a little bit closer to um, uh, Jevons' paradox. So let's go in here and go back to simulate control. We're advanced a couple of years. I'm going to put in my 50. Oh, wait, wait, I have to re no, I'm, I'm at the right year. So I'm, I'm going to put in my 50 and step to end. 
And now I got what I wanted, right? So I can see now that, let me move this over so you can see the results. I can see that my refrigerator went from 17 um, cubic feet up to about 25 cubic feet as a consequence of, uh, uh, of that change in the model. My refrigerators are getting larger now. It's more like what's happened over the last 50 years or so. Okay, so, uh, so that worked. But, um, but there's a couple of, still there's a couple of problems with this. And let me show you one of the problems. And this happens a lot in models, actually. We see this happen. It's kind of bugs that creep up in various projects over time. And you'll likely see this, too, if you're building models out like this, which is when you're building games especially, um, you, don't, you want everything that's shown to the user to be historical. You don't want to show them things that are changing. That if, you change, if they change a the decision, that the results change in the model. You want it to change for the next time period. Right, so if you change price, for example, in your model, you don't want to instantaneously change sales. The sales that the user is seeing is typically going to be historical, and you want to be able to change it in the future. Um, there may be some exceptions to that if you're doing a calculator or something, but on the whole, that's the way you want things to operate. If I go in here and change this uh, decision right now and just update it without doing anything, I can see that my average size changed instantly. So that's actually not a behavior that I want to see in this, in this model, so I want to do something about that. And uh, the other thing is that there's some things in here that aren't really formatted exactly right. Like, you know, the um, yearly spending on electricity here, if I mouse over it, is 136.29, which is okay, but really it's $136. It would be better to have it formatted correctly. And, you know, it's defaulting to the format that I had set up in my model, but I want to change that. And so now we can introduce the fourth model um, setting, which is, uh, uh, is properties. And so we can set up different properties which can change the default model properties for individual variables. So what I've wanted to do here is say that this decision is um, actually going to um, take place in the next time step and not the current time step. Execute decision immediately is what makes it happen in the current time step. So it's saying execute that decision in the current time step. It's set to true by default, um, which I want to keep. But for this particular variable, what I want to do is change it to false. So I'm going to say... P for property, I needed to say property of what? Well, property of this variable dot execute decision immediately. So it's dot execute decision immediately. I want to make it false. So now it will um, actually take place in the next time step and not the current time step. And secondly, what I want to do is change um, the number format for things that are dollars. So price of electricity, for example, I want to change to uh, to dollar sign dot uh, um, like that, um, so that's uh, so that's a different uh, number format there, and then also maybe the yearly spending on electricity. I want to do the same thing, so I want to say the yearly spending on electricity should be um, should keep the same format. Okay, so I've made those two changes, and oops, I made a mistake. Uh, yearly spending on electricity error in formula. Oh, you know what, I forgot the equal sign. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, and that's very typical too. It's a um, reason to do these iterations here. So now I can see yearly spending electricity. If I mouse over it, I can see it's uh, $136 now, and that's going to be reflected in my user interface. So the approach that we're using for this is the model builder defines the format for the numbers, and those get consumed by whoever's working on the user interface, and sometimes those people are the same person, but sometimes they can be different people, so that's a nice way to structure things. And we can also test our model now to see if this now works. So we before, remember, average size increased instantaneously. Now it doesn't affect average size instantly, but if I step forward one time period, then it jumps up, and that's what we want it to do. So that's now working the way that we, we wanted it to work. Um, so we've solved some problems there. Okay. Um, now what I want to do is switch gears a little bit and show you a little bit uh, of a more of an, um, uh, a feature that I think makes this more useful than a spreadsheet. So so far, a lot of the things we've been covering, you say, well, this would be not impossible. It, you know, maybe it's this is a little bit easier to do in terms of you know you set it once and then you can run it out over any number of years than a spreadsheet. But it's still it's not really showing any special value over a typical spreadsheet. And I want to get into that. And the first thing I want to do to to show that some of that special value is um, by introducing arrays. So if we go back to our, um, our EIA data, 
actually, you know what, I have this online here. Let's just do it from here. Okay, if we go back to the EIA data, what we can see is that there's actually other kitchen appliances as well that are here, and, and another one is a freezer. Um, so you can see here that freezers um, also consume, uh, uh, consume electricity and, you know, um, in historically people only had refrigerators and then later on in life, you know, people or later on in, in time, as time advanced, people started to get freezers and keep them in their basements and things like that. So we have both refrigerators and freezers available. Um, so we might want to introduce both of them and look at how uh, Jevons paradox applies to both of those units here. So what I'd like to do in model as a way of introducing arrays is to do the fifth and final type of model statement here, which is arrays or ranges. And we, the way we define those is by R. So an R is a range, and I'm going to call this appliance. The name of the range is appliance. I'm going to make this equal to, say, refrigerator. Let's see if I can spell this correctly. Uh, or freezer. So those are the two types of things that we have here. And then all I need to do is, is, um, is add that array range uh, to the variables that I want to have it defined for. So here we have appliance. For, we'll put appliance here. And so that means it'll do both refrigerator and freezer. Um, for price, we don't really need that. But um, for the initial size, we do, because the initial size is likely to vary by appliance, right? Um, and then, of course, things that use those variables, we're going to need it for as well. So I'm going to put in a range, range for the electricity efficiency ratio, uh, the average size, and um, the yearly spending on electricity. So we have those in there now. But so far, it's not very interesting because we've defined all these things as to be identical to refrigerators. So if we ran this right now, might as well run it just to illustrate it. Um, what you'll see is everything looks identical. There's no differences here because all the initial values are, are the same. So to make this useful, what we really need to do is redefine these things. And what you use to um, provide different values for um, for array ranges is curly brackets. So if I want to say that my, ref and they, they follow the same order as the array range. So 17 is for my refrigerator, but let's say I think that freezers are bigger. They're going to be at 20 cubic feet. And I just put it in that way. So now it's saying the initial size of the refrigerator is 17. The initial size of the freezer is 20. And I can even do this inside of an equation. So this is a, there's a lot of flexibility actually to this language. Um, and so what I can do here is say, well, 1239 is what a, what a refrigerator is, but what the EIA says a freezer is is 1039 right here, right? So if I go oops, if I go here and put in 1039, then I've defined this, and then the initial size is already being pulled from this, so I don't need to do anything about that. It knows already that this is going to be 20 for freezers, and now I can save my model, and I can see. Um, that the vari there's variation among the two of them, or between the two of them. And I can even you know, go in here now, I can see that for my two decisions, I can see different decision values that I can set, and they're going to work the same way. And all the other things that I've set up, I get kind of for free here. So now if I, if I drop this down to 40 and step it to end, what I'll see here is for average size now that the, um, the average size of a freezer has gone up because the energy efficiency of freezers has gone up, whereas the refrigerator has stayed the same. So that's kind of worked work the way I want. And um, there's a lot of functionality that's related to array ranges. There's dozens of special functions that are available, and you can use many, many ranges if you want. Sometimes we've used as many as, say, eight range, different range types um, in, in models. Um, and so that can be very powerful. But, you know, as a starting point, this sort of illustrates um, how this works. Just to give you a little bit more flavor or in indication of how these, these things get structured here, what I want to do is put in a, uh, an array range, or how you might sum these up. So if you have two different appliances in your house, you might be interested in, well, how much um, electricity are both appliances consuming together? So I could add something like total yearly spending on electricity equals, and then I'm going to use a special function called array sum. And then what, for, year, for array sum, all I want to do is put in yearly spending on electricity. And now what that will do is that will sum that number up. And I actually probably also want to format it properly. So what I'll do is I'll take that and, and, and create a special, the number format here so that I'll use that same number format. Um, and now if I save that, um, what I'll see now is the total spending on electricity is here. And I can go back to my simulation control and I'm going to change this, say, to 50 and this to 40. 
and step it to end, and I can see um, that these things have changed. But <laughs> actually, it doesn't change the yearly spending electricity. Why is that? Because what, what's happened in the model here right now is that as I um, increase my efficiency, I increase the size, right, proportionally. This is like a perfect, uh, perfectly equilibrium balance uh, the way that I've set this model up. So, uh, so the yearly spending on electricity never changes because as my efficiency goes up, I just get bigger refrigerators <laughs> or freezers. So, uh, so it actually didn't have any impact out here. Okay, uh, the last concept that I want to, uh, last kind of new thing I want to introduce for um, for today with with this is another kind of way of using array ranges um, to look at how things might change over time. And there, there's a function that's used in a lot of system dynamics packages around setting things graphically. Um, that's something that can be done that we'll use a lot when we get to the user interface design. But I want to kind of set us up for that right now and also show you another more sophisticated use of, um, of slightly more sophisticated use of array ranges. So let's try that. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to create, say, you know, one thing I've left out here right now is the price of a kilowatt of electricity. And I've said earlier that it might, that might vary by state, for example. But it also might vary over time, right? So over years, depending on um, uh, rate cases that the utility companies provide, that, that number is going to be uh, edit, you know, altered over time. So I can put in the price of a kilowatt hour uh, uh, electricity I'm going to call this uh, electricity array. And this I'm not going to, I don't need to define this up here even. I can define it locally. I can define it for a specific variable. I'm just going to say 0 dot dot 5. Okay. And then I'm going to say that's equal to, well, let's start it off. And again, we, we, for array ranges, we start with the curly brackets. I'm going to say it starts off at 11 cents, but then um, it's going to go up to, say, 14 cents. And then it's going to go up to, um, let's say, 15 cents. And then it's going to drop to 12 cents, and then it's going to go up to 16 cents. So that's unusual, I guess. But I'm going to go ahead and put that in as my as my values for that. And then what I'm going to do is change the price of a kilowatt hour of electricity so that it, it uses that as its input over time. And the way I'm going to do that is use something called array graph. And I'm going to do open paren. And now I'm going to use, remember I said that step is a number that always starts at 0 and then advances uh, per time unit from there. So uh, this makes this more flexible. So I'm going to use step here as my input to the array graph. So the array graph is going to return a value based on, um, based on step advancing in the simulation. So again, it's going to go as the sim advances, step will be either it'll go 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. cetera. Um, and then I want to tell it what the initial um, value of step is that I want to compare the initial value of my array to. I'm going to say that's 0 as well because step starts at 0. And then I want to say, in, in how many increments do I want to look at? And how many step increments do I want to look at, at at future prices? And I'm going to say two. So what that means is that in 2010, uh, the number should be 2,000, or it should be 11 cents. In 2012, it should be 14 cents. 2014, it should be 15 cents, etc. So we're going to go in increments of two here. And then lastly, what I need to do is give it the uh, array range that I used. And I can also, by the way, I could just type this in. If I wanted to, I could put this value in here, but I'm not going to do that here because I've defined it. I'm just going to put it in as a variable name and then close that off. So now I've got the price of electricity defined here um, by this variable here that's set up um, to change over time. So I'm going to go ahead and save that, and I made a mistake somewhere. Uh, let's see, need more array elements or subscript. Um, oh, let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so this is wrong. <laughs> what I really need to do is add an additional so I said 0 to 5, and there's only, uh, that's six total elements, and I've only put 5 in here, so I forgot my last one, so I'll put in 18 here as my last number. Um, and, uh, and now we have it running, and we can see that the yearly, uh, total yearly spending is now changing, the yearly spending electricity is changing, and that's all because if I go to, um, let's look at my variable here of uh, price of a kilowatt hour of electricity, we can see that that's changing over time. And what's interesting here, too, as well, is that the array graph does interpolation, right? So, um, well, what happens at 2011? It's the, it's the intermediate value between uh, 11 cents and, what was the next one, 13 cents? 14 cents, I think I said. 11 to 14, so it's, I guess, 13 cents here for the intermediate value. Um, so you can see that kind of plotting out over time. 
Um, and so that's how that array graph used. And again, I said that's kind of a foreshadowing some of the things that we're going to get to later on. So we have about 15 minutes left for today, and I want to just uh, first off kind of cover some of the things, that, some of the concepts that we've covered for today, and uh, and then get into um, uh, other questions that some of you may have on the call today. So what we've covered is, is similarities and differences to spreadsheets, so kind of look at how those things compare to one another. Um, we've covered the five statement types that are used for creating models. They're variables, decisions, model-wide variables that apply to all other model-wide properties, pardon me, that apply to all other variables and decisions, and then specific properties that apply to individual variables and decisions in the model. And lastly, we talked a little bit about ranges. And, and again, we, we didn't cover the depth of ranges. We just barely touched on, just put our toe in the water in terms of functionality with ranges there. We covered a bit of a sample of the um, functions of Fourier Simulate. And I think one of the things that we implicitly learned from this was how to iterate back and forth using the model explorer to test models. So, and this is the way that I actually go through and build models is, is you know, is go through, add some equations in, um, go to the model explorer, test out how it's behaving, and then go back again. We did the array range basics, and oh, look, we forgot. What is the biggest mistake that new modelers can make? What is it? Well, <laughs> this is my opinion. This is after over 20 years now, I'm uh, happy to say, of, of, uh, of building models. There, um, it's something that I've seen, that I did myself early on in my career, um, and I've actually had projects that have been based on uh, working with um, models that were, uh, that needed to be uh, fixed because of, because of this basic issue. So I believe the single big, biggest mistake that a new modeler makes is writing too many equations before testing. So it's ver because of this, the language, um, the, it, what we saw us go through, I think it's, once you get the hang of it, it's very easy to add equations and things. And it's sort of fun, right? You usually go through this, always say, oh, this goes to this. And, you, and what you, ends up happening sometimes, especially when you're first starting to build a model, you might add 20 equations at once. And you say, okay, now I'm going to go test it. Well, now you have, if there's a problem, and there almost always is. I mean, you saw me today. I prepared fairly substantially for this workshop, and I did uh, probably three or four or five times today, mistakes in my model that needed to be corrected. If I had continued and just done the whole thing at once, I would have had that, uh, you know, I, I would have had a lot to clean up. So I, my advice, and many of the people I know on the call today are expert model builders, um, but many also are building models for the first time. So um, for those of you who are building models for the first time, and I believe also those experts that are on the call with me today would agree with me on this, is that you should test your model in the Model Explorer. I would advise really after one or two equation changes or model changes. So kind of like what I did today. You know, you, you start with something basic, you test it, you look at the behavior, you discover that it's not quite right, and you iterate. And you just keep doing that until you, you get the model working. And by the way, there's still, as probably many of you realize who are on the call today, there's still many problems with the way this model is working. Um, so we're going to continue this. this uh, we're going to follow this thread through for our next workshop and, and kind of get into um, some of the other things that can be improved um, in this model. Um, but what I thought we could do is I, I don't feel like um, I can really assign homework here. This isn't a university or anything like that. But I did want to offer up, for those of you who are interested, some challenges for the coming week. And, uh, and if you're interested, too, we can help you with it as well during the coming week. If you have some questions and things like that, I'll provide you a method for asking questions in, in a moment here. But um, I thought one thing that you might try uh, doing in here that would be fairly easy, I believe, is extending this model to include a third array element. So for example, you could put a dishwasher in. So that's something that you might experiment with. There's um, one of the problems that exists in this model um, is that we saw that the price per kilowatt hour changed, um, um, but it doesn't really, it didn't affect the refrigerator size calculation. We went pretty rapidly here, um, so we didn't really get into that. But if you believe uh, Jevons' paradox, then part of it also is that it's not only the implicit price due to energy efficiency, but it's also the explicit price of kilowatt hours, right? So both of those things should affect refrigerator size. And the way I've built my model right now, it doesn't do that. So that's something that we'll correct next week. But you might play with that on your own as a way of kind of thinking about how you would implement that. And then lastly, because I know most of you who are attending this workshop today are interested in building your own model, I, I would suggest just get started on it. Just, you know, put together some, don't, you know, what I would uh, recommend, um, especially for those of you who have not built models before, 
is to do something very simple. Just do, say, something fewer than 10 or 20 equations, something along that size range, uh, and and just you know play with these basic features. Don't 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 get too advanced. You know, we're going to have opportunities in the coming weeks to do more advanced stuff. So just to get to something at that stage, and that might take you an hour or two. Um, offline here, and it might be a good way to get started, and you know that can maybe anticipate having something that works well for you at the end of the six weeks here, um, like we discussed at the beginning. So what's next? Well, I um, we've already kind of gone through what we're going to be covering over the next several weeks here, but what we're going to cover next week, just kind of building on where we are, is um, some more advanced array functions. We're going to get into some more sophisticated things related to that. We're also going to get into covering state functions, and state functions just to give a kind of a preview, are um, things that maintain the memory of um, variables in, the, in, in a model. Um, and there's a variety of those. In a way, well, in fact, one of the state functions, the most basic kind of state function, is that initial uh, function that we use. So the initial value, since that re retains the value of that variable that we use uh, and its initial condition, is a type of state function. But there's, this is one of the fundamental aspects to System dynamics modeling. We want to get into that as well as well as covering things about feedback and delays. Those are sort of the other kind of critical elements that we want to cover here. Um, there's a little bit I want to say about games versus planning tools that relate back to using execute decision immediately. And then because it's such a big issue with building sophisticated models, I want to talk a little bit about locating and solving model errors. And um, as I said, we're going to continue to do this by building on our Jevons paradox model and hopefully end up with something that. Um, is you know roughly um, modeling the behavior that um, Jevin uh, defined in his sort of early statement. So lastly, what I want to do is just talk about some resources that can help you um, during the week and even um, after, even outside of uh, this workshop. So by by far the, the most, it's probably obvious to everybody, but the, the key uh, resource that's available is Simulate itself. So if you go to Fourier.com/simulate. You know, my recommendation is you can copy. We're, we're going to, by the way, we're going to send you a, a, a copy of the model that we built here today, so you can take a look at it, or you can actually copy it into your own account and change it if you want to. Um, and um, uh, but you can also create your own your own new model um, there as well, and you know that was something that you can experiment with. So that's the most probably useful resource that's available. Matt is going to send you an email that contains a link to the presentation that I made today so that you just have those notes available on it. A link to the Energy Information Administration data in case you're interested in doing the um, dishwasher example. And uh, as I said, also a link to view and copy the model. Other things that are available, if you need help with your model, um, you, you can ask us on the help forum. So let me, let me just show you where that is here. So if you go here and you, um, let me make this smaller because it's going to be easier to see here when I'm, when I'm uh, back to normal size. There we go. Okay, so here in the upper right, you'll see help support. And if you click on it, then you can see here's the support topics out here. And uh, um, an, an easy way to get help on um, building something is just to uh, uh, click on new topic and then um, and then put in your name and ask a question. And then we're very the reason I, I think this is the preferred way of asking versus an individual. Like um, you also should feel free to email me directly if you want, but but. I think this works better because there's a lot of people monitoring it. So there's a lot of, you know, it's not just uh, me who's available as a resource, but there's, you know, a uh, um, number of people that are available that can, can help answer questions. And some people know a lot more about parts of the system than I do. So, um, so that, that's a great way to find out things, as well as using the help system for the docs. So up here in the upper right, if instead of forums, if you click uh, docs, you can get um, access to the documentation um, for, the, uh, for the tool as well. And um, uh, you can, with both of these things, what you can do is search for old questions. Um, there's a search mechanism that's built into it as well, if, if, if that's something that you're interested in. Okay, we're just about out of time. I think we have about five minutes left. And um, at this point, uh, I just want to see if anybody has any questions about what we've covered today or other things that uh, might be of interest to you that we're going to cover. You know, keeping in mind that we're going to we have uh, many five weeks uh, for proceeding. And Matt, do you see any questions that people have? So um, the question is, if a decision is not executed immediately, how do we tell it when to execute? And it is pre-set up for you. So um, in execute decision immediately, the only two options are execute decision in the current time step or execute it in the next time step. 
So you can't tell it to execute in a later time step by using the execute decision immediately property. Um, so there's, if you need to do something like that, if you had something where you said, I have a, you know, and an example of this might be, say, building a factory, and it's going to take four years to build, say, a fab line for, a, um, for semiconductors or something like that, then what you can do is you can say the decision to, de to build the factory begins, you can start that, but then you can use something called a delay function, which is one of those state variables that I'll cover next week, and uh, you can delay the availability of that capacity by a number of years to, to achieve essentially that same result. Matt, other questions? Um, yeah, there are. There's a, there's detailed information, on, and what we can do is send send that to that person. The detailed information about where to find that online, where you can see all the different types of number formats that are supported. Um, but I can tell you just off the top of my head, you know, that you can do percentage, for example. You can do uh, scientific notation, and one of the sort of fancier ones that I like to use is something called short number format. And what that does is um, Keep, if you need to have numbers really small, you can put like a K or an M or a B after them, right? So, for example, if you have a thousand, uh, then you can choose to do one K, and obviously it takes up fewer characters. So, when sometimes when we're um, when we have limited space in a user interface, we'll use that that format as well. But anyway, we will send you a link to um, to the number formats. Sure, I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat it last time. And uh, Matt, the, the, uh, the question that you asked was, does it matter what order the uh, equations are in when you use the previous function? And the answer is no. It doesn't matter what order the equations are in. Meaning, by order the equations are in, I'm, what I'm referring to is, uh, let me go back to where I was here. Um, To, the, to these equations here, like if I move these somewhere else, because if I had a previous function, it's not going to make any difference. The, 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 one of the um, main things this engine does is figure out what the right order is. Kind of the, the first thing it does is it looks through all the equations and finds where the starting point is and then, and then works through it. Um, so you, you never need to do that. And that's true of um, all, uh, remote, all the system dynamics desktop packages I know as well. They kind of work the same way, as well as Excel, obviously. What else? Any other questions, Matt? Yes. No, there's other ways of getting, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh, so the question is, what if you have really large arrays? And I, um, is there, are there other ways of inputting parameters? So I think that the issue is that the um, person is referring to is that um, I don't want to, it's, it's going to be kind of a hassle for me to put in, um, uh, in like say I had a, a, a hundred numbers that I wanted to input or, or even Ten numbers I wanted to input. It would be a big hassle to enter them one by one in in those little fields. Um, uh, so no, there's there's actually um, multiple ways to get data in that can suck it in all at once. Uh, one of the most common ways is a drawable line graph, and we're going to cover that in week three. Um, so uh, two weeks from now we'll uh, be discussing the drawable line graph, and that's one way to get like a lot of numbers in at once. There's also this ability. Here, actually, I'm showing it on the screen right now. I didn't realize is up, upload data, and what upload data allows you to do is upload uh, spreadsheet data into your model, um, and that's something else that we can we can cover in the future. But that's uh, that's ability. Like if you have a, just a lot of spreadsheet data, and you want to upload it and have it kind of replace numbers that are in part of your decision. You can do it that way. You can do that in this state, meaning we're doing it as sort of a designer mode, right? Because we're the we're the author of this particular account right here. Um, but you can also do it as part of your UI design. So in the UI designer, there's the capability of uploading data that way as well, and, um, and many other ways as well. So those are just two simple examples. And we have two more questions, um, and then we'll wrap up for the day. After I run the decision, how can I see the history of the decisions that were made? Well, the decisions actually are treated like any other variable in terms of results. So if I go through and look at the model explorer here, um, and let's say I, I make my decision uh, here and change this to 40, and then step it to end like we did before. So this variable, kilowatt uh, electricity consumed per cubic foot, if I go in here and look that variable up, kilowatt electricity consumed per cubic foot, what I can see here is that it changed. And so that number is, a variable, or is available here. If I look at a show table, I can see that it went from 
52 roughly down to 40. And then if I want to, I could even copy that to the clipboard and then, you know, paste it into uh, some other tool like Excel or something like that. So, um, so it's basically, the short answer is it's treated like any other variable in the model. Okay, last question. I know we're right at um, 11 o'clock Pacific right now. Yes to both. We are recording this as I speak and uh, shortly, and I think within the next hour, Matt, oh, I'm sorry, and I didn't repeat the question. <laughs> I'll get better at that as the weeks progress, I hope. Uh, so the question was, uh, while we have access to the slides and um, what was the, oh, and while this, is this session being recorded? So uh, yes to both those things. And uh, um, we'll be sending out a link to the slides and within the next hour. And we'll um, also shortly be sending out a link to the, um, the presentation from today. All right, everyone, it's 11 o'clock here. Um, thank you very much for attending today. I'm looking forward to talking with you all again next week. And in the meantime, like I said, if you have questions, please, uh, please let us know. And we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing what, uh, what you all develop over the next few weeks. Thank, thanks very much. Bye-bye.